are recording. So there we go. Now we are recording. Um, further housekeeping, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box that should be at the bottom bar um, that you see of the screen. Um, you can also post it in the chat. The difference is the Q&A box lets everybody see your question um, and it makes it easier for me to find them. Sometimes they get lost in chat, but I'll answer them wherever I see them at the end of the presentation. Um, also for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in chat, but just in case I missed a setting somewhere, um, please don't click any links other than what I may post, just for everybody's safety. And because a lot of you seem to not have a rain barrel, I will post a message right here to everyone. Um, and there, you should be able to see there's a link to the Conservation Foundation. Uh, that is where I work and who's presenting this presentation today. Um, Conservation Foundation uh, has rain barrels for sale through Upcycle, which is a local company out of Morris. So for those of you who like to buy local, doesn't get much more local than that. They are also reused. So repurposed barrels that were used to ship over things like olives and pickles and peppers. Um, Upcycle gets them. They would normally have to be thrown out because by law, they can't be reused. So Upcycle gets them, washes them out, retrofits them to be rain barrels. And because they had food in them originally, they're already safe. You don't have to worry about them having had weird chemicals or anything like that in them. So you get them and they're good to go. Um, so you can buy yours at the website that I posted in the chat. Um, for those of you who can't see the chat, it's www.theconservationfoundation.org. And then you can navigate through the section of our website. So uh, if you're looking for a rain barrel, highly recommend it. It is, to be honest, the highest quality ones that I've seen for the best price. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. I have my presentation here. We're going to share. Whoops, we don't want to start in the middle, though. We want to start right back here up at the beginning. So here we go. Here comes the rain again. This is me. I am Jamie Vibach. I am the Will County Program, mm -hmm. I should, probably should say director, um, for the Conservation Foundation. Uh, there's my email address. Uh, the phone number that's on there is my office line. I am, like most of you, probably working from home right now. So phone calls, probably not the best way to get a hold of me, but I get all of my emails and I respond to them as promptly as I can. So email is a real easy way to get a hold of me. If you have any questions after this, um, I'm more than happy to answer them. And even though I am the Will County person, um, we do have people in the other four counties that we serve, Kane, Kendall, DuPage, I'm sorry, other three counties, um, Kane, Kendall, and DuPage. And I'd be happy to pass your information on to the appropriate person. So, uh, and if you are located outside of the Chicago suburban area, um, please feel free to get in touch with me anyway. I'm more than happy to consult by phone, as well as put you in touch with uh, your local land trust, wherever that may be. So thanks again for joining us. And here we go. So the Conservation Foundation, our mission is, is really to improve the health of our communities. Why do we care about all this nature -y stuff? It's for our health. And those of you stuck inside, stuck at home now know how nice it is to be able to go outside once in a while. I am making it a goal to get outside and walk my yard, walk the neighborhood, do something just to get outside because it makes all of us staying at home a little bit easier. Uh, we are also an accredited land trust, which I know most people aren't gonna understand what that means, but trust me, it's a big deal. It just basically means that we're doing things the right way. And so why is conserving open space important? Because it helps to preserve our quality of life. So water quality and drinking water, that's a big thing that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, but it also improves air quality, habitat for wildlife. Kids, kids need to be outside. So good for their health, both physically, mentally. It's just good for all of us to get out there. And it's our responsibility to, to future generations to take care of this so that they can enjoy the same things that we are enjoying. So the biggest thing we're gonna be talking about today is keeping rainwater where it falls. 
I love this picture because you can see you got that storm sewer there, but having all those native plants planted around it actually helps to keep water out of that storm sewer. And it's a great way. I would imagine that where this area is, this homeowner probably had a real wet swampy area there before they put those plants in there. And by having that nice collection of plants there, not only do they not have to mow it anymore and risk tearing up the grass and making it all muddy again, it just looks a whole lot nicer. So for those of you doing e-learning with your kids at home like I am, maybe having to refresh yourself on the basic science principles here, I won't go too deep into this, but this is really where it all starts. So if we look at the precipitation, we start up there in the clouds, the rain comes down, where does it go? Well, it's either gonna go like you see at number five here, it's going to be surface water runoff and it's gonna go right straight down that grass out into whatever the nearest body of water you have, or it's gonna go down into the ground to recharge that groundwater. So if you're like me and you live in an unincorporated area where you have a well, that's where your water comes from is that groundwater. Some cities even have deep wells. Um, Joliet, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, is currently on a deep well, which punches a hole down into the ground to get water out from underground, but it's running out. So they're needing to find a new source. So we wanna recharge that groundwater as best we can because that's where our water is coming from in a lot of cases. That groundwater also flows underground, eventually ends up in the oceans where it evaporates, lakes, whatever, um, goes back up into the clouds and kind of starts that whole cycle again. So we wanna keep our groundwater where it falls because the more number five, the more surface runoff we have, that's when we exacerbate the flooding. So we wanna try and prevent that by getting the water to go in the ground. So this is kind of what we're talking about here. If you look in the top left corner there, you can see for natural ground cover, so that's zero impervious surface. So no asphalt, no concrete, no houses on top of it. It's just, you know, ground. Um, so this is what you might find in a forest preserve, something like that. So you get about 10% runoff. So that's that water coasting along the surface of the ground until it gets to a body of water. About 50% infiltration, so that's going down into the ground. 40% evapotranspiration, which is, for lack of a better term, plants sweating. So plants taking in that water and putting it back up in the air. So on a low density residential area, so more of a rural area, now we've got about 10 to 20% impervious surfaces. So we got a little less infiltration happening, a little more runoff, and because there are fewer plants, a little bit less of that evapotranspiration. By the time we get up into that high density residential industrial commercial area, now we're getting into like 75 to 100% impervious surface. That means the water can't go down, so it's gotta go over the surface into a body of water. And again, this is the stuff that contributes to flooding. When the water can't go down, it's gotta go somewhere. And we humans have done a really great job of finding ways to collect it and get rid of it as quickly as we can. We're, we treat it like a waste product and it's really not. You know, if we were to go back to the time of our grandparents and our great grandparents, they knew what a great resource that was. And they used rain barrels and they used cisterns and things like that to trap the water so that they could use it to water their plants and water their crops because it wasn't as easy to come by as it is now. So the more of that infiltration that we can get, the better off we're gonna be and the less flooding we're gonna to have to deal with. So I mentioned Joliet and it, it's really kind of interesting because when I put this presentation together about two years ago, they were just starting to talk about what they were gonna do because they knew back in, what, let's see, when was the date of this? This was in 2017, so three years ago. Um, they knew basically by 2030, their wells were gonna run dry. So they had to come up with a new way of getting water because you know you can't you just can't have that. So they were exploring other options, and recently, you know, within the last six months, um, decided on Lake Michigan. So they're going to be getting water from Lake Michigan now. 
But again, we are running out of water. If this is happening in Joliet, it's happening in other communities as well. Other communities are facing this problem where we are running out of water. So again, the more we can conserve water, the more we can capture the water that falls on our property and use that instead of always pulling from the well, so to speak, um, the better off we're gonna be in the long run. So rain barrels are a way to trap the water that normally would fall on your roof, be collected in your gutters, and then get pushed off either down into the storm sewers or maybe just run across your yard, depending on, on how you're set up. A lot of people just have them tied directly down into the storm sewers. The problem with that is you get a substantial rainstorm, everybody's doing that, that overloads those storm sewers. And, and again, pushes too much water out into the rivers too quickly and creates flooding issues. So having a rain barrel does your part to help keep the water that falls on your roof right there, as well as giving you a source of water that's quite honestly better than tap water. Um, Rainwater has got more nutrients and things in it. It's better for your plants than tap water, especially if you soften it or whatever. Um, rainwater is just overall better. So being able to capture that water and use it later is great. And so you can see the pictures here. These are several of the options of rain barrels that we offer, all different colors. Um, they're basically about 55 gallons. So this is free water that you get every time it rains. So for those of you who get a water bill and like to plant lots of plants and maybe have a garden, this is a way for you to get 55 gallons of free water when it rains. So how do they work? Well, quite simply, you cut off your downspout, direct it into the top of the barrel. So the top of the barrel is screened. It prevents mosquitoes from getting in. So you don't have to worry about the standing water issue with mosquitoes and all of that. The rain barrels that we sell have screen on it that's specifically small enough that it won't let mosquitoes in. So the screen on top also helps to catch any of the debris from your roof and keep that from clogging up your rain barrel. So the water just directs from your gutter down into the rain barrel. And then there's that spigot down at the bottom that you can attach a hose to or a watering can. And then you've got your water to use however you'd like. Really, really easy to install. Um, you know, for me, the first time I heard cut your downspot, I was like, oh, you can't do that? Well, yeah, you can. And it's not a big deal. Um, that little flexible hose piece that you see coming down from that downspout, um, I was looking them up on Home Depot yesterday. They're like two, three bucks. So real easy to do. Obviously you need to disconnect them in the winter. You can't let water stand in there over winter. Otherwise you'll crack your barrel. Um, but the barrels can stay outside as long as you disconnect them. So that's all there is to it. They're really, really easy to install. So rain gardens are another option to help keep water where it falls. So the idea here is Imagine if you've got an area of your yard that's maybe a little bit of a depression, water collects there, it's really muddy, grass won't grow. These are some of the common complaints that we hear. So you take that depression, maybe you make it even a little bit deeper. It doesn't really need to be beyond about six to 10 inches deep. Um, and then you put plants in there that particularly like water. So by having those plants there, native plants have really deep roots, which we'll talk about in a minute. And those really deep roots help to channel the water down as well as sucking it up. So instead of having this big muddy patch in your yard, now you've got this beautiful garden full of plants that love that water. So here's kind of a side sample of what a rain garden looks like. So you can, so for example, the one I have, I've directed my downspout down a dry stream bed that's just sort of like a uh, rocks. And so it's just kind of a thing of rocks and the water goes down there, go, flows into the rain garden and collects there. Then there's standing water, but then it dries up. So it, you really don't have to worry about mosquitoes too much because that water level fluctuates so much mosquito larvae take a long enough time to develop that even if mosquitoes do lay their eggs there, it dries up pretty quickly 
and you don't have an issue. So, um, and a lot of the plants that are in there too also happen to be good for birds and butterflies. So not only do you have the color from the flowers in there, but now you've got lots of butterflies. Um, one of the first years we had our rain garden in, we saw a heron of all things decided he was gonna come see what there was to eat in my rain garden. He maybe, he might've found a frog or something. I don't know, we usually have a lot of little frogs hanging out in there, but it was very cute because it was not a big rain garden at all. And here's this giant heron standing in the middle of it. Oops, let's see, there we go. So this looks a little bit more like what I was describing. So my downspouts directed into that rocky area there down in goes away from the house you want it about 10 feet or more away from the house away from your foundation um, just so you don't have to worry too much uh, about grading but you've got your soil mixture you can add in there um, make it a little bit sandier to help with the drainage uh, the roots of the plants also help to keep the water go down um, and there's lots of different ways that you can do them but as long as you have a depression in the ground and native plants in there, you're pretty much good. So to design your garden, we like to consider these kind of zone A and zone B. Zone A is gonna be for your wettest plants, so, or your, your most water loving plants. So you might put something in there like world milkweed. That's a really pretty one. And for those of you who are familiar with monarch butterflies, world milkweed is an Asclepius which is a host plant for the monarch butterfly. So it's one of those uh, milkweeds that you can plant in your yard that will attract monarchs to, um, to your yard. Foxglove beard tongue is another pretty one. This is another favorite of uh, native pollinators. Real pretty. Uh, blue stem goldenrod. Be careful with the goldenrods. They can get, depending on the kind you have, they can be a little bit aggressive, but the blue stemmed one is a nice one. Uh, lots of real pretty yellow flowers on them. Bee balm, boy, that one's one of my favorites and really another favorite of the pollinators as well. Uh, grows real easy and just really beautiful flowers. Black-eyed Susans, very commonly used one, very striking yellow flowers, that's a great one. Cone flowers, another very common, very well loved by the pollinators. And prairie drop seed grass. Having some grasses in there too can give you a little bit of height as well as filling in some areas um, in between the plants, in between your flowers a little bit. So um, all of these are very good for the center wettest portion of your rain garden. Zone B then is the kind of the outer ring. So you've got something like swamp milkweed out there. Blue lobelia. Okay, uh, oh, and swamp milkweed again, another favorite of the monarch, another member of that Asclepius family that monarchs will use to lay their eggs on, um, and very pretty as well. I love swamp milkweed. Um, blue lobelia again, very, very striking, beautiful blue flowers on that. Marsh blazing star, another gorgeous plant. White turtle heads, a fun little guy too. Um, they like it nice and damp. Um, and blue flag iris, boy, those are absolutely gorgeous. Um, they really just, they're very, very stunning in a garden. Uh, Golden Alexanders, another one that can get a little aggressive at times, depending on how happy it is. If it's happy, boy, it'll just take off, but very pretty flower um, and another favorite of pollinators as well. And then sedges can go anywhere. We've got a fox sedge, we've got the oval sedge, eastern star sedge, and long beak sedge. Basically, these are just they look like grasses um, and they can fill in areas because obviously nature abhors a vacuum. Not, rain gardens are not real easy to mulch necessarily, so having grasses and things in there to take up the space can help prevent your weeds from getting in. So College of DuPage put in a rain garden. These are all the happy people who helped to plant their rain garden. Um, you can see a nice design they had here. This was a really muddy area that they had trouble getting anything to grow, didn't want to mow it, so they turned it into a rain garden. This is uh, one that we have at the McDonald Farm at the headquarters of the Conservation Foundation. You can see here, the, again, the water comes down the downspout here, 
flows down this little rocky path. Very tiny spot for a rain garden, but it works. So it, it, it functions the way it should. There are more plants growing in there now than um, when this picture was taken, but you can kind of get the idea what's going on there. This one, little caveat, make sure it's legal to do before you try doing something like this. Um, this homeowner had this ditch in their front yard that was constantly standing water, muddy, and wanted to do something about it. You'll notice not everything in this rain garden is native, and that's fine. There's enough natives in there to have the benefit that we're looking for, um, that adding some hostas or some lilies in there are fine. But it was a nice way to make use of this existing depression they had in their yard and to keep that standing water away. So you hear me talk a lot about native plants and if you were here for my conservation at home webinar on Monday, you've probably seen a couple of these slides already, but we talk native plants extensively. And the reason is because not all plants are created equal. Native plants are what's supposed to be growing around here. They're what we are used to here. What are, not what we are used to, but what our animals, our birds, our butterflies, that's what they're used to. It's what they know to eat. So when you use natives, you're directly benefiting those pollinators. So we already talked about the water table, how they help with that infiltration, and it saves you money and time. They actually did a study and they found that using native plants are 50 to 60% less costly to maintain than um, traditional landscaping plants. So they save you time, they save you money, they don't need to be watered, they don't need to be babied, um, because they're used to our conditions. They're used to our hot, dry summers, our cool, wet springs. They don't care. They're used to our heavy clay soils. You know, we don't have to constantly baby them and fertilize and water to make them happy. They're already happy. They're here. They're home. So when we say you don't have to water them, this is why. If you look on the right-hand side, you see some examples of native plants on the left are some more traditional landscaping plants that are used, but you see how shallow those roots are. This is why we have to continue to water our grass throughout the summer to keep it from going brown. Whereas if we were to use something like buffalo grass, which is a native grass to this area, only grows about 18 inches tall. If we were to have our lawns covered in that, you'd probably only have to mow about twice a year because it doesn't get any bigger than 18 inches. Um, Lawns were originally, many, many years ago, um, a lot of people used buffalo grass. I'm sure there was a reason they switched over to Kentucky bluegrass. I, I'm not sure why exactly, um, but I'm sure there was a reason. Um, I always like to throw out the fun fact, Kentucky bluegrass is not native to Kentucky. As a matter of fact, it is native to the Middle East. That's why it has such a shallow root system. You need a shallow net-like root system to hang on in a sandy soil type. We definitely do not have a sandy soil type here. Um, here in Northeast Illinois, um, we are very heavy into clay. Well, the roots that you need for sandy soil don't do so well with clay soil. So that's why we have to constantly fertilize and aerate and water to keep that grass happy, to make it think it's still in the Middle East, even though it's not. So I actually just put a patch of buffalo grass in my yard. I had to take out um, an area that had a bunch of wood chips in it before. Um, so I've reseeded it with buffalo grass. So I'm very excited to see what's gonna happen with it and what it looks like, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but if you compare the black-eyed Susans to the daylilies, similar type flowers, both brightly colored, but those black-eyed Susans, boy, they're, you're not going to have to do much with them at all. Um, they're not going to get out of control like the daylilies do. Um, I, I heard somebody one time say that if somebody tries to offer you plants because they went crazy in their yard, don't take them or they're going to go crazy in your yard. So just something to keep in mind there. So these are some substitutions that you could make if you're looking for native plants to put in. So here are some places to start. We've got the pink turtle head, 
you can do pink or white, either one's good. Virginia wild rye is another good one to put in there. We talked about swamp milkweed, black eyed Susans, blue flag iris. All these are great choices for your rain garden. Now, one of the questions that I hear a lot is, well, I don't wanna put in a pollinator garden because I'm allergic to bees, or I don't wanna bring more bees to my yard. So there are three to 4,000 types of native bees here in the Chicago suburban area. Those native bees are not the ones that are going to sting you. They are way too busy collecting their nectar and their pollen that they need to survive. They're really not interested in you. On top of that, if they even have a stinger, this little guy down here in the uh, lower left, he doesn't even have a stinger, but those that do, those bees that do have stingers, they're kind of like a fish hook. So they've got a barb on the end of them. So when they sting you, it actually rips out the back part of their abdomen, they're gonna die. They know this. So they only sting if you're really bothering them. You know, you have to be grabbing them, stepping on them. I don't recommend that. Um, so you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. The ones that are more likely to sting, on the other hand, are the yellow jackets. Now I compare them here to honeybees. Honeybees aren't actually native either. They're an introduced species, much like, you know, any other agricultural animal. Um, you know, it, it was kind of a weird thing to think about um, the first time I heard that, but it's true. Honeybees are Italian. Usually the ones that, that we use here, the ones that beekeepers here get, um, they are not native here, but they don't really cause any problems. So they do a lot of good pollinating for our farm crops. So we kind of leave them be, no pun intended. Um, it's the yellow jackets that tend to cause a problem. Yellow jackets are a type of wasp. Big difference, wasps are carnivores. They're looking for protein and salt and things like that. They're not the ones going after your flowers. So yellow jackets are the ground nesters. So they're the ones you're gonna see coming out of the ground. Um, but their stingers are more like a hypodermic needle. So they can sting over and over again and fly away laughing. Um, I swear they do. Um, and, and especially in the fall, they seem to be really bad tempered. It's like they know they're gonna die. And there's a whole story behind it. I won't get into it now, but it's, it's actually pretty fascinating. But basically in the fall, they're in a bad mood and wanting to sting something. So, um, but they're not the ones that are going after your pollinators, your, you know, your pollinator gardens. So you don't really have to worry about increasing your chances of being stung when you plant a pollinator garden. So we have this happy guy here. Uh, he actually has a pump on the top of his rain barrel. I've never used one. I know they're available. Um, the rain barrels that we sell just have the spigot at the bottom, so they're gravity fed. So you just hook up your hose to the bottom, open up the little stopcock at the bottom, and the water comes out. So if you want to put a pump in there so that you can get every last drop out of the bottom, you can do that. But you don't need to. But once you have all your new plants, you can use your rain barrel then to water them. You can also use the water out of there to wash your car, wash your dog, water your indoor plants, water your hanging baskets, your window boxes, anything like that. Just make sure you use the water. Whatever you capture, make sure you're gonna use it. Um, people will often ask me, well, how many rain barrels should I have? Well, the, it's more a question of how much of the water can you actually use? If you've got tons of landscaping that needs to be watered around your house, put in as many as you want, but make sure, just make sure you're gonna use the water. There's really no sense in capturing that water if you're not gonna use it. Generally, one is what I recommend people start off with. And if you find yourself going through that and needing more, then maybe add a second one. But most people, one is plenty. We also have our conservation at home program. Having a rain barrel or a rain garden is part of our conservation at home qualifications. So there are, I think at this point, we are over a thousand certified properties in our area. Um, I am the one who does the conservation at home visits for Will County. So when I go out, what the qualifications that I look for, I look for a variety of native plants. Uh, we wanna make sure we're feeding as many different types of pollinators as we can. So, you know, I had one lady ask, well, why can't I just fill my yard with coneflowers? 
well, you, you could. It's a little boring, but you, if you really want to have the biggest impact, you want to have a variety of different things for them to eat. It's like you don't want to just eat hot dogs for the rest of your life. You know, you have to have some variety in your diet. So by having a variety of plants out there, you make sure that you can feed the widest variety of pollinators possible. So we look for the variety of native plants. We look for doing something with your storm water. So rain barrel, rain garden, any of those. Um, I also look for bird feeders. Are you, how, how are you feeding other critters? Um, you know, do you have shrubs that have uh, berries, uh, bird feeders, things like that, a bird bath. Um, we also wanna make sure you're not overusing chemicals in your yard. So having that Chemlon guy come out, really not great. Um, it, a lot of that, the chemicals that go on there end up in our waterways and cause a lot of pollution, and a lot of problems for our waterways. So that's not to say don't use any chemicals ever. Um, sometimes, especially if you've got invasive species in your yard, sometimes a little judicious use of Roundup is the best way to get rid of those. Um, and again, that's to say not mass spraying everything, but targeted applications, following the directions where you need it, when you need it, all of that. So those are the kind of things that we look for when we go to certify. And the visits are free. So if you're interested in, in learning more about this and having a free yard visit, you can drop me an email. And once we are all over this social distancing thing, um, I'd be happy to come out and um, walk around your yard with you and we can talk natives. Or maybe you already have a yard full of natives and all you need is your sign. So you can just, you give us a call and we'll come out um, and there's no charge for the visit. So there's a couple different philosophies when it comes to native plants. I call this one native but neat. It's a little flower bed that has a lot of different plants, um, all neatly arranged and cared for and mulched in, and it looks great. Um, you know, any community in the area would look at that and say that is a well-maintained flower bed. There's also the wild and free. I tend to advocate this a little bit more for the backyard because let's be honest, we live in the suburbs and that's kind of what's expected. So in the backyard though, I think this looks fantastic. You know, you've got a wide variety of plants here. You've got flowers, you've got grasses, you've got host plants for lots of different things. You've got nectar plants for lots of different things. I think this is awesome. And I guarantee this is swarming with pollinators during the summer. So where do you buy them? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the plant sales have been canceled. Um, the Conservation Foundation has moved to an online plant sale. So you can place your orders online May 1st through 3rd for pickup May 8th and 9th. Um, the Nature Foundation of Will County is having their plant sale. I think that I've heard they are going to online sales. Um, you can check them out. But you can also order yourself from any of these nurseries that I mentioned here. These are all nurseries that focus on native plants. They don't use the um, bad insecticides and things that we really don't want to be seeing. And they also, for the most part, tend to go with uh, the wild type of the plants too, instead of the um, cultivars, which aren't quite as good. Beware the big box stores and conventional nurseries. I don't mean to badmouth any of the big box stores, but I have heard way too many horror stories about people buying their native plants from there and you know maybe they raise monarch butterflies, they feed some of that milkweed to their caterpillars and all the caterpillars die because everything's been treated. And, it, and it's not even that the big box stores are the ones treating it, it's their growers that do the treating because people want plants that look perfect. That's the only way to do it. So just, be aware if you're gonna buy them, make sure you go from a nursery that specializes in that kind of thing. So here in Will County, how are we helping? Well, we're working in downtown Frankfurt at Prairie Park. We're helping do restoration of that site. Um, we've been working out there for a couple of years now and it is really starting to look fantastic. Um, we're also helping our homeowners associations care for their ponds. I've done a couple of consultations with homeowners associations who are looking to take better care of their ponds and get them looking a lot nicer. 
um, and also helping residents make better landscape choices through our conservation at home program. If you are interested in getting involved with the Conservation Foundation, you can become a member. If you visit our website, theconservationfoundation.org, you can, there's a great big button up there that you can donate and become a member. Um, once all of our social distancing is over, you can also come out and visit our McDonald farm in Naperville. We've got samples of solar panels and um, windmills, green roof, uh, rain gardens, pollinator gardens, um, prairie plantings. It's fantastic. I love working there. And it is a 60 acre farm in the middle of Naperville. 49 of those acres are farmed organically through our Green Earth Harvest program. And you can also become a shareholder of that farm, which means throughout the summer you get to go out every week and pick up, or every other week, and pick up a share of the vegetables that are grown there. So it's an organic farm, everything is grown right there on site, and the produce is phenomenal. I've been a member for, well, the, basically the three years that I've worked here, and it's the best produce ever. So um, highly recommend that if you're in the neighborhood or um, have a drop-off site nearby. Uh, we also have the Dixon Merst Farm out in Montgomery. That's another fun place to visit. It's a historic farm and they do lots of fun events out there. Um, you can follow us on social media. You'll find out when we're going to be doing other webinars like this. Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of those good things. Um, and then you can also get your yard certified. Give me a call. Even if you haven't started yet, if you're not sure where to start, you give us a call. We'll come out walk around, talk with you about native plants and, and help you get started. All right, with that, I'm gonna close out my screen and I see we've got some questions here. So, let's see, it's done, okay. Um, I'm gonna go back up, scroll back up here to the questions. Do the stands come with the rain barrel? No, they don't come with automatically, but you can buy one. Uh, they do sell them as well as that flexible ho hose. You can order all of that stuff um, from right from our website. Um, I don't remember how much the stands are exactly. The rain barrels are $60. For $5, you can have it delivered anywhere in the area here. Um, and like I said, the stands are extra. And then if you wanted to buy that flexible hosing from them, you can, or you can just go to Lowe's or Home Depot or someplace and buy it as well. Um, how to connect one to the downspout. Um, there are all kinds of videos and um, websites out there on how to do it. As I said though, it's really pretty easy. All you gotta do is you, you just direct the water from your downspout right into the rain barrel. There's really no connection or anything like that. You just kind of, aim the water right at the rain barrel. So through that flexible hose, you cut your downspout, attach that flexible hose piece and direct it right in there. So really, really easy to do. But yeah, there are videos out there. Quick Google search will get you all the information you need on there. Uh, grass for a shady yard. Um, sedges. Sedges are really good for shady areas. Um, uh, what is it, Virginia? Is it Virginia sedge, uh, Carex? Carex is the, the genus, and there's lots of different types. Um, one of my favorite things to do when I'm looking for plant types, uh, Possibility Place Nursery has a website. On that website, they have a plant finder. You can enter in your conditions, and it'll populate a list that match those conditions, so, um, and, and show, as well as show you pictures of what they look like. So. Um, but yeah, sedges are really a great, um, great choice for a shady yard. Um, plants for a shade garden, or a rain garden that is shady. Um, plants for a rain garden that is shady. Yes, um, I have a brochure. Give me just one second here to pull this up, because I know there is, I should have had this up before. Um, for wet shady areas, blue lobelia is good. Columbine, yeah, columbine is really good. Woodland phlox, um, shooting star, jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit's awesome if you can get that one to grow. Um, wild geranium, 
pen sedge. That's the one I was trying to think of before. Um, all of those are really good for shade. Um, sometimes my water has a bad odor to it. Is there anything I should do to help this? Um, I'm not sure that there's anything you can do specifically. It's going to depend on whether, first it's going to depend on where your water is coming from. If you're on a well, you can get it tested. Your county health department generally does the testing for free. You just take them a water sample and they'll do all the testing for you and they can tell you if there's an issue with it. Um, that's, there's really nothing that you're going to be able to do like plant-wise or anything like that to help clear that up. That you're going to need um, a professional well and septic company. Um, if it's city water and you're having that problem, then definitely contact your city on that. Um, oh, so I had somebody from the Conservation Foundation come out when I started to nativize my home and it was very helpful. I'm glad to hear that. Um, oh yes, I can put my information back up on the screen. As soon as I do that, I'm not going to be able to see the questions though. So um, I will put that back up at the very end. Um, do you think with coronavirus, they may often a shipping option for native plants? Um, most of the, so for the Conservation Foundation's plant sale, I know we are doing a contactless delivery. So basically you pull up and we'll just load them into your trunk and you can go. So um, Possibility Place I know is working on being able to ship native plants, that's an option. If you wanna just order them online and have them delivered, Prairie Nursery and Prairie Moon Nursery are really good places to order from. I've, um, I order from Prairie Moon. I'm actually waiting on a shipment from Prairie Moon. Um, but they, they actually have some good collections of plants that you can order. So like if you're looking to put in a pollinator garden, you just order their pollinator garden collection and they just ship you a whole bunch of different plants that go well in a pollinator garden. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, is there a roof size square footage minimum to support having a rain barrel um, for your shed? There's really no minimum for it. Um, Obviously, the smaller the roof, the less water you're going to get. But yeah, there's really no minimum. You know, anything is better than nothing. So uh, yeah, you could definitely put that on your shed. That would be fine. Um, oh, yes. And you set your rain barrel on a couple of cinder blocks. So yeah, that's how I have mine as well. Um, my dad is very handy and they built a, a stand, nice wood stand for it. It looks great. Uh, we just piled up some cinder blocks and as long as you get it at least, I think it's at least 12 inches off the ground, um, you want to be able to fit a watering can underneath it and as well as to help that gravity feed. Um, Lures Garden Center and Hillside also carries native plants. Okay, that's good to know. I'm not familiar with that one. Yes, Carrick's, Carrick's Pennsylvanica. Yes, that's the pen sedge. Um, wet Shady Yard, Carrick's Pennsylvanica, um, yeah, sedges, all the sedges are good for uh, wet and shady. Those are really good. Um, Morton Arboretum, yes, uh, the Arboretum website has a plant finder feature as well. With how deep will the roots go for prairie drop seed? Can they be transplanted easily? I'm not sure how well they are transplanted. I, I know because, yeah, because their roots go really deep, um, I've never really tried to transplant them. Some natives transplant better than others. Um, can't hurt to try. Um, yes, this, um, somebody asked if, they said they missed the beginning of it. Yes, it will be, it is being recorded currently. So we will share the link for that afterwards. So anybody who missed it, or miss part of it, or just really likes the sound of my voice and wants to hear me again, um, can come back and um, rewatch it again. Um, Sally asked me to repeat the website. I'm not sure which website. I've mentioned a couple of them. Um, if it's the one for the Conservation Foundation, it's theconservationfoundation.org. Um, and then all of our rain barrel information uh, is underneath there as well. Uh, there's also rain garden information. We've got a rain garden brochure that you can get to from there um, as well. Um, how long can the rainwater sit unused? Any potential issues? 
Um, I wouldn't drink it. I mean, I wouldn't drink it anyway, but really, I don't think there are any issues because it's not like mosquitoes can get in there. Obviously, you, you can get bacteria and things like that growing in there and algae and all of that. So I probably wouldn't let it sit for too terribly long, but you know, just use it probably if you can over the course of the next week or so. Um, rainwater from the barrel has the odor. Ah, um, I don't think there's any, it, it, I mean, it depends on what's causing the odor. Um, I don't know of any that would like hurt your plants or, you know, cause problems that way. But um, I know like the one that I have has a slight plasticky sort of odor to it, but it's, it's really harmless and it does tend to go away after a little while. I have a sloping yard leading to a storm drain in both back corners. Tips for installing a rain garden on a slope, top, middle, or bottom of slope. I would probably go to the bottom of the slope just because that's where your water is going to collect. Um, you know, there, there's no harm in going up the slope though as well. So, but yeah, the water is going to collect at the bottom. You know, that's probably where I would put it. You could turn the whole slope into a rain garden if you really wanted to, if you had that kind of money. All these projects depend on how much time and money you want to put into them. You know, if you've only got the money to do a small one, definitely do it at the bottom. Will sedges work in full sun? Depends on the sedge. Um, so again, that's knowing your plants. And if you go to the uh, Possibility Places Plant Finder, they'll tell you right in there what kind of conditions that plant likes, whether it can handle full or partial sun or whether it likes sage better or uh, shade better. All right, let's see. Oh, more questions. Um, can we purchase a rain barrel for pickup at the native plant sale? Um, yes, we do offer pickup at the farm, uh, McDonald Farm in Naperville. We offer pickup for rain barrels there really anytime. So if you wanted to schedule one for pickup during a native plant sale, I don't think there would be any issue with that at all. Um, please describe the diverter, which I understand will divert the rainwater that would otherwise overflow the rain barrel back into the downspout. Oh yeah, so there is, as you mentioned, there is a diverter device. So it's kind of a Y-shaped thing that's got a flange that you can flip back and forth on it. So you flip it one way and it diverts the water into your rain barrel. Or if your rain barrel's full, you can flip it the other way and it'll divert it back into the downspout. Um, so yes, those are available as well. Um, I don't have one. Our rain barrels come with a, um, there's a, another nozzle at the top and you can attach a hose to that and angle the hose away from the house as a way to also deal with the overflow. Um, you know, if you have some place to put it, like a little pond you could divert it to or whatever, um, any of those are also good options. Um, let's see what else we got. Are there any local or state laws or ordinances in Kendall or Will County regarding having a rain barrel? I've heard some states consider the rain the property of the state, therefore rain barrels are illegal. Thank you for bringing that up. I meant to address that. No, in Illinois, you are entitled to the water that falls on your property. Uh, so it tends to be more states with lots of grazing. Um, I, so out west, it's a bigger issue. I think California has recently repealed those kinds of things and they've started allowing rain barrels again. But no, Illinois, rain barrels are perfectly legal and you are welcome to have um, as many rain barrels on your property as you want. Um, okay, so answered that one too. Let's see, well, sedge, let's see. My understanding is if you have an asphalt roof, water from a rain barrel should only be used on flowers and not herbs or vegetables. I have not heard that. Um, I use my, I, I have an asphalt roof and I use my rainwater on my vegetables all the time. Um, I'm, I am not aware of issues. That's not to say that there aren't any. I'm just saying I am not aware of them. 
Um, okay. Any other questions? Let's see if I can share this screen with you again so that you can have my information. Here we go. And share. There you go. So there now you can see my email address again, jvbach at theconservationfoundation.org. There we go. Now I got my chat up here too. All right. Well, I hope I got to everybody's questions on there. I tried to find them all. Um, if you have any other questions, if there's anything I can help you with, if you're interested in our conservation at home program, please feel free to reach out to me, jvbach at theconservationfoundation.org. Um, and I am more than happy to help you out as best I can. Thanks again, everybody. Um, and thanks for all the love. I see all the thank yous in the chat. So hope you enjoyed this. Um, I had a good time as well. This has a, been a great opportunity for me to be able to reach out to people during a time when I should normally be out all over the community giving presentations. So thanks everybody. Have a great day. See you soon. Uh, bye. And...